Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending our program today. Um, I would like to welcome all participants and fellow members of the American Bar Association International Law Section. I'm Natanya Ustun, and with my co-chair, Kelly Blount of the Middle East Committee, we are really encouraged to see your participation in today's program. Our program today is the rise of intolerance on college campuses, focus on free speech. This program came to our minds because of what we see as increased divisiveness on college campuses. And with the, and what we see in the news as well today, because of how students are targeted, not only for what they express, but also for the communities they belong to. Also on a personal note, I'm a parent with a college student who is seeing this firsthand. So today, instead of having fellow attorneys educate us, we are, all, we are so pleased and we welcome the leaders of tomorrow. Two undergraduate students, Hannah and Ezra, led by our amazing moderator, LJ Sylvester. So I'm handing this over now to Kelly, who will give us a biography on each of our, part, our speakers. Thank you so much. Thanks, Antonia. We are very, very lucky to have our speakers with us, as well as LJ as our moderator. Very briefly, <clears throat> Ezra, who is here with us today, he, Ezra Landman Fagelson, is a sophomore at the University of Illinois at um, Urbana-Champaign. He majors in urban planning. He's a modern Orthodox Jewish student and is active with the Halal and Shabbat on his campus. He's also a representative on the student council and we're very lucky to have him. Hannah, who we're also very, very happy to have. Hannah Abu Hamda is a freshman at Pace University in New York City. She majors in psychology and criminal justice. She's a first generation US citizen of Palestinian and Egyptian descent. She's in the process of creating a students for justice in Palestine chapter with some of her other um, with her other students and has been an intern for the UNRWA organization, the UN Na uh, Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East. We're very lucky to have both of them and hope that you'll that you'll enjoy what they um, will enjoy or and take away um, what we think brings a lot of value from this conversation. Finally, but not least, LJ Sylvester, who will be moderating today our discussion. She's a seasoned executive with a background in both sales and business development. She brings extensive expertise to the realm of technology startups and having started her professional career in the publishing space, she remains committed to partnering, partnering with higher education clients in order to help them achieve their institutional goals, which is why we think she will be, um, uh, why she brings so much value to this conversation as well. She's based in Northern Virginia and she serves as Pura Technologies Head of Business Development. Pura, as will maybe come up later, is a threat intelligence software, co uh, software company and its mission is to make the internet and the world safer by identifying and tracking threats and dangerous narratives across the uh, unmoderated social media sites. She's a mom also, both to a college student and a high school student and she eagerly engages in discussions on pressing issues, such as the effects of social media misinformation and how it, how it contributes to, to these types of issues, such as intolerance. She's a graduate of Florida State University's College of Social Sciences and Public Policy and a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. I will leave it to you, LJ, and I very much look forward to hearing um, the conversation that I know will be very fruitful and valuable to all of us listening. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Natanya. Um, you know, again, Ezra and Hannah, thank you for not only taking time out of your schedules, um, you know, and, and classes and everything that's going on on campus, but thank you for agreeing to sit down with us and have a really, you know, uh, informative conversation. So, um, you know, we all appreciate that. So with that said, uh, I definitely wanna make the most 
of the time that we have. We have a lot of ground to cover. Um, and for our attendees, just to provide a little bit of, uh, of uh, structure for you in terms of today's agenda. Uh, what we're gonna first dive into is the discussion around free speech. Uh, what does it look like on college campuses? The importance of free speech. Um, you know, so we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna have a lot of questions around that. And then we're going to pivot and discuss what happens when free speech becomes hate speech. What does that look like? Does it look the same for Ezra as it does Hannah? Then we are going to look at the role social media plays around free speech and hate speech. And then lastly, we will conclude with examining the role that colleges and universities play in protecting their students. Um, what role does administration play? And also what can students do uh, to make their campuses and their collegiate experiences positive as well as safe. Um, so with that, Ezra and Hannah, all right, time to come off mute. So let's just start sort of, you know, high level. When you think about free speech, what does that mean? And what does it mean or what does it look like when speech or free speech turns into hate speech? So um, Ezra, if you'd like to go ahead and, and, and you know, dive into that. Yeah, for sure. Um, just disclaimer, um, all the views and opinions that I'm stating are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the university, which I'm a part of. So when does free speech cross into hate speech? Very good question. Something I've been pondering a lot the last few weeks and months. So when I think about it, I think, you know, when you see it, um, some elements that I feel I can point to are when people are being targeted based on their identity rather than their politics, or when you see that words are mixed with actions that are intimidating or they interfere with people's senses of safety and they can encourage or lead to physical harm. That I think is crossing from free speech into hate speech. And what can make it really hard is, is when words are chosen to delegitimize people or groups in absence of dialogue. So you don't necessarily know if people using those words or terms are understanding the potential impact of what they're saying right that could lead to it could lead to to harm of those people or people who are part of those groups mm -hmm. yeah thank you yeah you 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 touch on a lot of really good you know sort of sub points and we definitely will circle back to a lot of those um hannah can you expound on that and share with us, you know, your view of free speech and, you know, and in that same breath, what what does hate speech look like? Mm -hmm. um, again, I will be speaking about my personal opinions and experiences, and I do not represent the views of my university. Um, I think that free speech crosses the line into hate speech once there are targets or insights of violence and discrimination or harm against individuals or group bases on race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or disability. And also when there are threats of inciting violence towards these groups or organizations of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I appreciate the fact that you you know, are, are very descriptive in, in terms of, you know, oftentimes people sometimes think of free speech and hate speech as this or that. And you, you sum it up quite well in terms of it can affect a variety of people and, and groups based on, you know, all of the various, you know, classes essentially that people identify with or fit into. Um, so this is going to be a very poignant question. Have either of you experienced or been confronted with hate speech on campus as it relates to your ethnicity or your religion? And if so, 
if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us. Um, well, I've certainly experienced hate speech on campus that related to my ethnicity and religion. Um, I felt um, that these have been challenging experiences and one being where I had a free Palestine sticker on my laptop, which ended up to an unsettling encounter with a student questioning my beliefs and led to an accusatory comment of why support terrorism. This situation escalated into confrontations and unwelcome comments from others, leaving me feeling intimidated and anxious about potential harassment and discrimination from larger groups. Additionally, during this, uh, additionally, I had an experience on a Zoom class. I found myself in an uncomfortable position when my professor, identified, who identified as Jewish, singled me out regarding my views on the war in Gaza based on solely my name. He then later explained he wanted to hear my view on the situation due to my name being from the Arab world. The situation heightened my stress levels, and as I grappled with discussing my opinions in a classroom setting with unfamiliar peers, fearing both academic and social repercussions, including concerns about my grade being unfairly influenced. Despite these challenges, I hesitated to seek assistance from the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office. I felt uneasy and lacked confidence in the office's ability to effectively address the issue, as well as while I attended the meetings of the Muslim Student Association seeking support, I found the focus primarily on religious matters rather than addressing the broader political and ethnic identity issues affecting Palestinians. It is important to recognize that the struggles faced by Palestinians transcend religious boundaries, impacting individuals regardless of their faith. It is, a cru it is crucial for our communities to acknowledge and address there are injustices collectively. Well, so all of that from a sticker that you had on your, your laptop, there's a lot to unpack there. And, and I, I, I wanna come back to that, but I also want to hear from Ezra and then we can open up the dialogue a, a, a bit further to, to uh, dissect some of that. Um, but thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I appreciate that. Ezra, have you experienced you know, any type of discrimination, particularly since October 7th, uh, on campus as it relates to being a Jewish student. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I definitely I've experienced I've experienced hate speech. I have experienced what was it this was November. Um, um, students Justice for Palestine was hosting a walkout. And during that walkout Students were chalking and writing messages on the quad, on the ground. And, you know, I ended up having a conversation with one of them. And I was telling them, you know, when you're writing, when you're writing from the river to the sea, that is, right, that is something many of us in the Jewish community find, find hateful. And when I tried to engage her in this discussion, um, she she wasn't she wasn't having it. She didn't realize she didn't realize it was hateful and didn't really want to have that discussion with me. And the following week, um, SJP hosted they they um yeah what they called it, but. They were marching around the quad the day that the board of trustees was meeting to discuss. I don't know what was on the agenda for the meeting, but um, SJP's agenda was for them to divest from from certain corporations. And I went out. I happened to be on the quad at the time, and I went over to just see what was going on. Keep in mind, I am riding my bike. And normally when I'm on campus, right, I wear a yarmulke. So I'm identifiably Jewish. And so on my bike, I had my bike helmet on. And I'm going over there to see what's going on. And some of them actually approached me and they're like, are you here to support the cause? 
So decide to, you know, I'll try to have a discussion with them. And I'm like, so what's this cause that you're, that you are, um, that you're trying to, you're trying to support. And they were telling me, oh, we want the university to divest from these institutions. And I'm like, so if that's really what you're calling for, then why are you guys chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, right? That has nothing to do with the university divesting from these institutions, from these corporations. And when, when I tried to engage in that discussion, people I was talking to were very, very much evading my questions. And looking back on that, I'm thinking, you know, if I had gone there, and I was wearing my yarmulke, I don't know if they would have come to try to have that discussion with me. Okay. It's interesting. Both of you have had recent experiences on campus and in the classroom. And Ezra, uh, in your case, you know, you were going to engage in a conversation and dig a little deeper. And Hannah, I understand being in the classroom, you know, different approach that that you took. I'm interested, Hannah, your experience in that particular course, did that course relate to what was going on, you know, politically, um, you know, in, in the world? Or was it a one-off, you know, comment and, and, you know, interaction that occurred there? Yeah, the class was not at all related to politics. It was an English course. Um, we were actually talking about Walt Whitman. So I was caught really off guard, mm -hmm. um, especially having my camera off and then being called repeatedly to turn it on and then being asked about my opinion on the conflict due to my name being from the Arab world um, and having to discuss my opinion in a classroom of 30 students I'm not familiar with. I don't know what their views are. I don't know how I'm going to be perceived. I don't know if there are going to be any repercussions from this. Um, and then after I answered and gave my rather diplomatic stance, because again, I felt uneasy, um, then the professor moved on completely. It was as if he just wanted to hear my opinion and then the conversation completely shut off. Yeah, interesting. Thank you for, for sharing that and for diving in. Um, yeah, I appreciate that and, and, and I'm sure others do as well, just to you know, understand the context uh, of how that was presented. Um, so do you feel, and, and I will uh, bounce this one to, to Ezra, do you feel that hate speech has intensified? And and I'm bouncing this question to Ezra first because Ezra is a second year student, uh, so he does have a little bit, you know, of you know of some some uh, comparing and contrasting compared to you know first year being on campus to now being a second year student. But um, what are your thoughts on hate speech, and have you or do you feel as though it has become more rampant as compared to this time last year? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I have to say, definitely, it has, it has definitely become much more rampant. And I mean, definitely, in light of recent events, but what I think a big factor in all of this, there is a, I find there to be a lack of education and acceptance by others. Um, People have been wrongly taught that certain slogans and chants don't constitute hate, don't constitute hate speech. And some people might be ignorant, not know better, and others willfully and making hateful statements. So actually the story I was telling before about uh, the girl who I saw chalking, I went up and asked her which river, which sea, to see if she actually knew what she was talking about. And... She didn't know any better. And the response I got to that was, she says, you know what? I shouldn't even be talking to you. We're not supposed to engage. And these were the instructions that she received by, by Students Justice for Palestine. So when I see that the lack of dialogue and unwillingness to, to hear other viewpoints 
that's just leading to more hate speech. And, you know, and I, I will say that, you know, this, I feel, is the first of many steps as young people, uh, even though in this setting, you are not representatives of your respective universities, but education is that first step to understanding. And, and so I appreciate you stressing, you know, the fact that this, this student, you know, perhaps was not educated on, on things. Um, Hannah, what are your thoughts, you know, on why hate speech has become, you know, so rampant on, on many college campuses? Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely noticed a difference from the fall semester and the spring semester. Um, and I think hate speech has become more rampant on college campuses because of social media. There's more accessible, there's more accessibility to anonymity on social media, which causes people to feel as though they can exclaim hate speech with no repercussions. And majority of the time this falls true. The unlimited freedoms of social media can cause echo chambers within college campuses and limit openness to discussion and debate which then leads to situations that can cause discomfort and friction to the communities in dispute. Common forms of hate speech can be one simple post regarding a microaggression or stereotype and bullying of political stance. And then with the widespread of media, this can be exacerbated to cause more harm to the victim. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect transition, you know, into, you know, sort of going into social media. Um, and and I, I feel like we're going to spend a, you know, a, a good chunk of our, our time, you know, talking about that. Um, before we do, one one sort of last question is it sort of relates to the general theme of free speech and and hate speech. Um, you know, in in terms of your generation, um, you guys are a lot you know younger than uh, than a lot of us who are you know on the panel and and attending, and so it's it's nice to be able to tap into. Um, different perspectives, but also perspectives from young people. Um, and so I guess my question is, do you think that there are limitations, you know, uh, being placed on your generation's ability to express themselves? Um, and, and, and I sort of preface this with, um, you all probably have heard stories from your parents, grandparents, friends, relatives of, when I was in college and back in my day, that's typically how the story, you know, starts, um, things were different. We engaged in debate. Um, you know, we used college and university as an opportunity to, you know, explore the world around us and, you know, all of that. But, you know, your generation is different. You guys have grown up with social media, um, your expectations around technology, are very different uh, from many of us who did not have any expectation. Um, and so, you know, do you think that there are limitations being placed on young people, particularly, you know, as it relates to the uh, ability to express yourselves and your views and opinions? Um, well, I feel that there are limitations on how our generation is able to speak. Um, purely in the sense that for specific causes, like how they speak to me and like controversial causes, um, because I've noticed the common trend where people tend to speak before they gain any real knowledge of a conflict or situation. And they feel as though the first thing they've seen or read on Instagram is true history. And they're very close minded to doing actual research and gaining more of a knowledge of what they're discussing and because of the platforms like instagram or reddit etc the algorithm of media will continue to show posts based off of the person interest and because of uh, this other information on the opposing side becomes blocked it leads to people becoming more separate and there's a lack of empathy when there are two opposing sides trying to conversate because in today's age, social media is able to segregate people to the point of isolating themselves from opinions that differ from their own. Excellent point. Very good point. 
um, Ezra, what, you know, do you feel as though, you know, there have been limitations uh, placed or are there limitations being placed on uh, your generation, you, your, your friend group? Yeah. So, so, um, I know just comparing it from, you know, as you're saying before, you know, back in my day versus today, you know, I actually just had a conversation with my father and he was telling me that when he went to college in the late 1980s, there was a protest when the Israeli Philharmonic came to his campus, um, but it was civil. And mm -hmm. now it seems that a lot of these events are being canceled because of, because of threats. So, yeah, so that's something you're seeing all around. Mm -hmm. Like you're seeing, I know I'm from Chicago and I'm seeing in Chicago, um, when organizations want to host uh, Israel rallies, um, they're asking people, don't post this on social media because there is an actual fear that, right, that if it's too publicized, it could lead to, it could lead to um, counter protests, which would be way out of hand. Um, and some other ways that like, people are being limited um, during, it still is the case, um, I was going around with friends, hanging up flyers, posters of the kidnapped victims who are, many of them are still hostages 170 some days later. And some of those flyers walk back within the hour and they'd be gone. People, people who some of them might be claiming to be activists were tearing down these flyers because it, it didn't fit their narrative. It was taking away from the other side of the story, but I, I that doesn't make sense to me. How is that? How is how is one event taking away from from some other from some other topic? Some other is how's it taking away from another event? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I I understand. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, looking at limitations that way, it's, it's, you know, limiting speech, accessibility, you know, in, in some instances. And, you know, um, Hannah, you mentioned, you know, social media and the algorithms and stories and news feeds that are populating based on other things that people have viewed or read or perhaps liked or replied to. And I wonder, um, I have a theory from a professional standpoint, but I have been itching to ask you guys this question and it, it you know, taps into what we've, we're talking about, but the larger concept around misinformation. So that word is being used a lot. It's being thrown around. Um, and I think that we probably could even take several steps back and, you know, if we were each asked to define what is misinformation, we're going to have three different definitions, you know, um, but as it relates to your personal experience, um, you know, are you seeing or have you seen any types of misinformation, misinformation campaigns on campus? Um, you know, what are the dynamics surrounding that specifically as it relates to geopolitical issues? And I know, Ezra, you sort of tapped into that about, you know, that student not knowing geography, really, you know, if we want to be, you know, frank with it. Um, but have there been other instances where this theory of misinformation has been put out there, but also fueled by other students or even outside community members. Um, I, I'm gonna uh, ask Hannah if you could, you know, tackle that misinformation, you know, question for me and share your mm -hmm. experience. Well, I've personally experienced the effects of misinformation when talking about uh, the conflict in Palestine with classmates. They were not well informed that there had been a conflict prior to October and they had assumed that there hadn't been a conflict prior. And this is due to Western media and media in general not bringing to light oppressed groups of people. 
And another example is misinformation that all Muslims are terrorists. While this hasn't always been directed towards me because of my European features, I'd always felt that other family members had experienced microaggressions due to the color of their skin and seeing the difference in how I'm treated versus how my family members are treated with the same background go goes to show how misinformation and stereotypes are placed on those who don't look European. Mm. Can we dig into that a, a, a little bit? I, I'd love to, if, if you're comfortable with sharing um, the differences between even family members, what, what was that? If again, if you don't mind sharing with us. Um, well, obviously I have like a white skin tone. I don't look like I'm Middle Eastern, um, but for some of my other family members who are tan skin or have kind of a more telling name because my name is Hannah, at the end of the day, I sound and look American, but for other family members who have more ethnic sounding names or appearances, I've noticed the differences in how people are open to discussion with me versus how they are open to discussion with other members. And I've noticed how I've, I've been treated with more grace um, versus other family members. And it's just kind of, in lack of a better word, it's just kind of crazy to see how I'm being so differently treated from people who have the exact same background of as me just because of our appearance. Thank you. So it, that's an example of, of misinformation turning into discrimination. And that's definitely, you know, an element of it. Um, you know, um, Ezra, do you have any other, you know, instances, you know, besides the one where clearly geography was not, you know, that person's strong suit, where misinformation exists and it, it's being, you know, perpetuated perhaps in some cases? Yeah. So, yeah, I do think misinformation has been rampant, especially regarding all the post-October 7th events. Um, you know, my take on it, a lot of what you're seeing, some things might, some things might be factually correct, but are taken way out of context, which lead people to, lead people to draw conclusions that are not necessarily the truth. Um, I've overheard conversations, I actually, I, I spoke at the Illinois Student Council meeting in October as a representative and as a Jew on campus, just about my experiences. And um, following that meeting, uh, a few days later, I I overhear a conversation taking place with the with the um, Illinois Student Council DEI committee. Mm -hmm. And they were saying the chair of the committee was saying two students were two students spoke about Israel last week, which they shouldn't be doing. And I'm just like, I just overhear this. I didn't say anything. I'm just like, I, I spoke about my experience. And mm -hmm. they got into they got into a whole conversation about how anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitism. And who are they to who are they to say what is and is not anti-Semitic? Right? Right. Every other Every other group, if something is, if something is racist, someone who's a member of that minority group or whatever, they can say, "Oh, this phrase, this is offensive to this is offensive to our race. This is offensive to our group." And what's been going on here? There's been a double standard where we as Jews, when we say, "Oh, what you're saying is hurtful to the Jewish people," right there. They're saying, oh no, it's not. Right? So all of a sudden we don't get we don't get a we don't get a say in what is and isn't hurtful to our community. So no. that's that's yeah. that's huge. And I I would say that anyone who's part of a a racial or an ethnic um you know minority um, maybe even, you know, gender 
how can someone tell me what my experience is, right? And you guys both, you know, um, have experiences as it relates to just being college students, but also as it relates to being a Palestinian American, as it relates to being, you know, a Jewish American student on campus. And so to have someone say, no, your experience no, that's not how you really feel. That's not right. I I can I can really empathize with that. Um want to dig into a question. Um let's see. You know, and we're going to, you know, toward the end talk about, you know, how colleges can, you know, what they can do, what what are they doing that that makes sense? Like, you know, this this is working. What can they do to, you know, um improve upon various things? speech, um, you know, the ability to organize an event. We're definitely going to touch on that, but um, I, I want to circle back to what um, Hannah had mentioned. And I um, am really, you know, sort of looking forward to diving into this um, because it talks about, you know, we talk about social media and, you know, people behind a screen you know, are very um, bold, you know, and they're fearless. And sometimes that doesn't translate to an in-class discussion or an event that's taking place on campus. Um, of course, it varies from individual to individual, but, you know, it, and we talked about, you know, college, you know, this place, it's a learning hub and, you know, and, and all of that great stuff, you know, that we think about when we, we think about, um, you know, moving on from high school to college and really becoming adults. Um, and so with that, I, I, I know that, you know, we sit here and we discuss misinformation and everything. Um, and where I sit in terms of what I do professionally, I see those posts. Um, I see the media, I see the images and not just from one side, but from all sides. Um, oftentimes I I speak with colleagues and tongue in cheek, you know, we say, gosh, do people like anybody? There's, you know, there's a lot of hate. There's a lot of anger, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, threats and violence that is being, you know, put out into this social media, you know, space. And so, you know, as we, you know, transition into social media, um, you know, if you have personal examples and, you know, and things that you've seen, you know, on social media, as you, you know, interact with it, please, you know, feel free to, you know, hey, LJ, let me tell you about this, or this is what we're seeing. Um, and I'll, you know, uh, try and do the same. But to sort of go into the social media place, in what ways, you know, would each of you say that? social media has contributed or exacerbated, it, you know, sort of beyond I'm sitting behind a screen, I can create whatever username I want and I can type whatever, you know, I want to. How else that maybe, you know, those of us who aren't active on Instagram or Snapchat or Fizz, we're not seeing this. So, you know, almost, I, I guess we're asking, could you give us an inside look into what social media looks like on college campuses. Um, yeah, well, like you were saying, social media has exacerbated tension significantly because using a screen as a protector, uh, you can say hurtful things with little to no repercussion. Um, from my experience, the platforms of Instagram and Snapchat have been the most vocal and significant platforms for students to share their unfiltered opinions, whether it has been harmful or not. There becomes more tension among students when these platforms are strictly being used to undermine the opposing view and treat others with disrespect. And I feel that with the openness of social media and the easel and how easily accessible it is to anybody, there really isn't a filter you can put on the things people are going to say or do to harass a different community. Mm. Has your use of social media changed? Um, you know, do you use social media at the rate that you used to pre October seventh, or do you still engage with it as you normally, you know, would and and have done? 
I'd say I engage with social media with a different perspective now. I would say prior to October, I would be using social media purely for my own use and for fun and kind of catching up with friends, different people, connecting. But since the recent events, I've now been using my social media more as a political platform and more of just posting statistics and awareness of um, the conflict in Gaza. And it's more so if I can spread awareness to any form of anybody who's using uh, social media, if I can just have one person see and understand where I'm coming from and seeing the heartache that has been happening for my family and for Palestinians for the past six months and years plus, um, then it makes it worth it to me because I'm using my social media as a way to try to help people understand where I'm coming from and see that it's not from a bad place, it's from concern and wanting justice. So social media has become your advocacy platform, essentially. Mm -hmm. Ezra, how, how if, if at all, has your interaction and use of social media changed over the last several months? Yeah. Um, so I found like in the weeks after October 7th, you know, being mindlessly scrolling through TikTok and I realized TikTok doesn't know what I want to see because I'm getting both sides with uh, both many different viewpoints, like some like just at each other. And I'm like, it's so interesting. Why, why does it not know? Usually social media shows you what you want to see. But first time, like I'm consciously aware, it's having trouble figuring that out. Mm. And say my use, especially on Instagram, um, has also become much more advocacy. I've been posting a lot about the ongoing events and like, you know, I just thought, you know what, I'm just posting because, you know, that's what a lot of people in the Jewish community are doing right now, right? I can't open Instagram and not see something about the ongoing events everybody's posting in their instagram stories but i've had people come up to me and they're like what you're doing on instagram it's amazing I'm like really i'm just like i'm just like reposting also just posting about my own experiences but i'd say like the way i've been using social the way people have perceived that i've perceived how i've been using social media has been it's definitely been different than it has been prior to october 7th okay Interesting. So Hannah, have you had that same, um, you know, sort of reaction from people to come up and say, thank you, or I you keep doing what you're doing, or I'm glad that you're posting, you know, uh, different things? Yeah, definitely. Especially because when I post on my social media, it's I'm as authentic as possible. I posted on uh, my Instagram story how I've had the loss of 30 members of my family um, in Palestine due to the conflict. And I think it's important for other people on either side to understand that this is a conflict that are affecting people all around the world. And this is a conflict that is affecting real life families. And I I think it can be harmful if you just see what you want to see on your on your social media and if you're not seeing both sides of the cause. Because at the end of the day, while there is a conflict going on, violence of any time, violence of any kind should not be tolerated. And if there's a way to spread the awareness that the violence is affecting people's families personally, then I think that they should be able to express that um these actions have transcended into people's personal lives and that it takes a more personal cause and people feel that they should be posting more awareness because it is such a personal um, event. Yeah. So when we, we heard your, you know, your bios at the start of, you know, the, the meeting here, 
I didn't hear journalism mentioned in either bio, but I, I feel as though you guys, you know, may come out of this with a minor or two, you know, in journalism. Um, so thank you for sharing your, you know, personal stories and experiences because whether or not we agree with everything or we like something or we give it a thumbs up, um, if our story and our experience can resonate and help someone who's struggling with something or going through something or they're able to, you know, read a post and realize it's not just me. I'm, I'm not alone in this. You know, you guys are definitely, you know, um, contributing to the, the greater good of humanity. So I just want to shout that out and give you both kudos for that. Um, in terms of, um, you know, social media being used, you know, by folks to spew hate speech, um, what do you think social media companies should be doing? Or are they doing enough, um, in your opinion, to, you know, to um, ban, flag, disable posts, comments, images, pictures? What's your take on on that? Um, well, Instagram does have features where um, if you go on like reels, then if you swipe, there will be something that says like sensitive content. And then you have the option to see if you want to continue to watch or if you just want to scroll ahead. Um, and they also do have a feature where if they detect misinformation, they'll um, notify you and let you know that it is misinformation, but you still have the option to view it, which I personally don't agree with. Because if you can detect misinformation, I don't think that you should let, you should have the option to let others view the misinformation because a lot of the times people will get it confused with factual information and kind of use these things interchangeably, which is when I feel a lot of uh, conflicts and debates and tensions stem from because people are because a lot of people nowadays, social media is their main form of news source. So if they are having the access to misinformation, I feel that um, people are going to be debating with untrue misinformation. Hmm. You you mentioned something that that you know kind of has me thinking, and 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 given that most of our attendees are uh, attorneys, I'm pretty sure that they are chopping at the bit, and I would be remiss if I don't put this out there. Social media companies can flag posts or comments as misinformation. Does that hinder my freedom of speech? Does my comment or my post if it's not, if I don't consider it misinformation, if I really feel like this is factual or I think it's the truth. Who at Snapchat, Instagram, Meta, who are they to say that this is misinformation? And so that creates a whole nother debate and, and issue as it relates to the freedoms of, of speech, misinformation, hate speech. And so it's, it's almost the cyclical <laughs> You know, it, it, it's like a, you know, a train just kind of going around on a train track. You know, at what point, you know, is misinformation is, you know, misinformation and who is able to make that judgment call. So uh, and I can see that, you know, on on campuses, because there are so many different, you know, social media sites and platforms that, you know, you all engage in, um, you know, what's put on one platform might be a little bit different from, you know, the other. There's not that, there's not a, a sense of continuity, you know, uh, amongst social media sites and platforms. So that's interesting. Um, not for us to debate, but something to sort of put out there on people's radars. Um, you know, Ezra, what's your take, you know, in terms of, you know, social media and, their responsibility, you know, maybe specifically as it relates to misinformation, um, are they doing an adequate job or is something missing there? So I think there's, I always think there's room for improvement. Um, but, you know, on one end, you have people posting misinformation that is leading to violence, hate, hate speech, and but on the other end, right, you have that First Amendment constitutional right. So, 
So I know like Twitter, they've also flagged misinformation. Mm-hmm. Personally, right now, I think that's a that's an okay balance. Mm-hmm. My thought, as I further educate myself, my thoughts on that might change. But uh, my thoughts now are, right, if somebody if somebody's going to post misinformation intentionally, not intentionally, and you have that, you have that little flag saying this post contains misinformation. I feel it's not it's not a violation of your first constitutional right, first amendment right, and mm-hmm. it in theory could could help um, minimize or mitigate um, the possibility of incitement of violence. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And you know, as we kind of wrap up, you know, the social media piece because we literally could you know talk about this for hours on, you know, upon hours. Um, I've seen, um, you know, an uptick in negative and offensive, hateful social media posts. Um, Again, most from alternative um, and unmoderated social media sites. Um, And so these are sites that don't flag or say, hey, that's, that's, that's not a nice comment. Uh, these are sites that oftentimes encourages people to um, post negative and hateful and violent things. So, um, so I'm seeing things that aren't being removed, um, you know, or or even flagged in in most cases. And so, you know, do you feel that the university, your universities, or just the university space? Do you think the university and campus spaces are doing enough? Because we, you know, we talk about Snapchat and Instagram and, you know, warnings, but there are lots of sites out there that are being used by young people, you know, um, many uh, folks on campuses that aren't being flagged. And so when faced with that, you know, do you feel as though the university is doing anything or are universities even acknowledging it? I, you know, maybe that's the the bigger question. Have you guys encountered that or come across that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think universities, you know, well, I can speak for my own university. I think there's much more they could be doing. So something that I've been thinking about is, you know, last year in my freshman year, I get all these emails. Oh, you have to sign up for this course about like, just sound like sexual awareness and all that sexual, uh, sexual assault. And, and um, you also had to do like a DEI training. And right. If you didn't take those courses, you get, you feel put a hold on your class registration for the following semester. Mm -hmm. So after I've seen all the events taking place during these last few months, I've realized, right, you know, students don't know student code when it comes to speech, when it comes to postering, right? Because I've seen people who are knowingly, unknowingly in violation of student code in those regards. So Mm -hmm. if the university could offer offer um right a mandatory mandatory class on speech and posting on social media what constitutes and doesn't constitute hate speech and if you don't do that they will hold, they will put a hold on your class registration that could that can make a difference and in the event that people take these courses and they're still knowingly posting information that is harmful or could lead to violence right then if it's a student within the university, then it becomes a question, does that student get to be a part of this university? Mm-hmm. Wow, um, that's, a, that's an amazing suggestion. Yeah, Hannah, yeah, definitely chime in. I feel as though that the university and faculty and administrations can support students who are kind of feeling marginalized by hate speech and just kind of marginalized in general by firstly engaging with students. I feel like there's a lack of um, kind of that faculty student engagement when it does come to comfortability with the student wanting to express how they feel kind of unsafe and unheard. Um, and that's 
also tying into my specific experience where I kind of didn't have trust in my school system that um, something would be done for me. And if anything, I would be met with repercussion. Um, and I feel as though faculty engaging with students is simply like the first step. And um, maybe in the beginning of each class, um, kind of letting students know that if they have felt marginalized or anything that um, a faculty member would advocate for them and possibly go to higher authority um, and the student can express that they've been feeling threatened and um, discuss possible solutions for the student to feel safe in their environment. Yeah, yeah, well said, thank you. Um, before we, we you know, transition, um, I'd like to, you know, get your take um, on, you know, misinformation. You know, you guys are seeing things on social media. How do you personally verify or fact check, uh, you know, some of the things that that you all see? Um, like, you know, do you Google it? Do you, you know, go to some other sort of uh, third party source, you know, to verify whether things are uh, in, in fact true? And I'm going to pick on you, Ezra. Okay. How do you, how do, you do your, your misinformation fact checking? Yeah. So, so there are some sources that, that pop up on my feed frequently. And those sources I know, right, half the time they're making things up. So mm -hmm. sometimes I'll take a look at it. I'm like, okay, good to be aware that this might be happening. Let me see. Let me see how other places are reporting on this, because I know half the time I've seen I seen the report on things no one else is reporting on, and they end up be false in the end. And I actually have a I have some friends who work for like a third party third party source, and I was speaking I was speaking with him, and I was getting to discuss you know how do you verify your sources, and he was telling me. Um, so, you know, like we, they have a lot of inside sources, but other times they'll get, they'll get, um, they'll see how someone else reports something. They might be a little bit iffy on maybe they're hiding something, maybe they're not, but, but they will post this source says, mm -hmm. so it won't, so they won't lose their credibility. Sure. But I always think that if you're going to repost something, if you're going to post something, it's, important to take a second to confirm it before you repost it yourself because mm -hmm. that's the key way how misinformation spreads because people see it repost and don't mm -hmm. think about it next thing you know the truth the truth comes out and right it, it, yeah no one no one cares at that point okay Good suggestion. Hannah, what, uh, what um, do you do to, to check, you know, for misinformation? Well, I feel that when posting on social media, especially about any sort of controversial conflict, let alone Palestine, it's extremely important to post factual information and um, to verify credibility. What I personally do is I go on reliable sources such as Al Jazeera or look at journalists' firsthand experiences in Palestine as well as family members to make sure that the information I spread is trustworthy. Um, in region of experiences, uh, these events uh, can range from reporting different religious and journal journalistic cultures. And it's important that your news sources are not just from a national source, but looking internationally to make sure your information is um, the least biased as possible. And, um, to understand that this is kind of like a universal understanding of this certain issue that I'm about to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, you know, in terms of, and, you know, let's continue to, you know, sort of um, stick with the, the campus experience as we slowly start to, you know, come to a close here. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, your experience as a college student, 
um, you know, we've we've touched on different things that, you know, your own universities, you know, can do. Um, Ezra, I think that you have a, a first year seminar in the making, if, if I say so myself. Um, you know, Hannah, your suggestions and, and what you're already doing, you know, with trying to start student groups, you know, these are great actionable, uh, you know, steps. And you guys have already started to sort of, you know, lay the, the foundation in terms of thinking about it, you know, um, that's the first step. And so again, you know, I mean, I, I that's, that's great that you guys are taking the initiative in, in you know, in that way. Um, but as it stands today, if you, you know, if, if your college or university president, um, and maybe they happened to have joined, you know, today's discussion, but if they were, you know, here with us today, and whether it's, you know, the dean of your college or the president of the university, or perhaps the university's general counsel, what would you tell them? What would be your expectations of them? as a student, uh, as a member of your campus community, um, as a Jewish student, as a Palestinian student, as a Muslim student, what do you expect of them? Um, so whomever wants to take that first. Um, yeah, I can start. Um, I feel as though uh, from my university specifically, there's an imbalance in support uh, that I've noticed. Um, there are very active Hillel chapters and student supporting Israel clubs, but when I've noticed when it comes to Arab student organizations, let alone Palestinian organizations, um, there's been a lack of involvement on campus and off campus. Um, I feel as though that it is important to have these organizations that are specific for a group of people because much like myself, I struggled with finding a community and feeling comfortable in my environment. Because as there is a Muslim Student Association at PACE, um, as I said earlier, it's more of the religious content. It's let alone of the specific community. And um, with Palestinians, there are Muslim and Christian Palestinians. So it doesn't necessarily transcend into the conflict. Um, I feel as though if I could talk to um, my school's president or um, authority figure, I would like to see them balance free speech, meaning as long as there's no direct or open insight of violence, every student should be allowed to express their ideas and beliefs, uh, feeling under the condition they are not directing or calling for violence from another student. Again, social media is uh, the same principles had. Uh, but there is a difference when people post a death count on a day. For example, on my social media, I post counts that rise in Palestine. And this is a factual statistic, meaning I'm spreading awareness. And I have every right to express my support and make people aware of what is happening in Gaza. Whereas social media, well, whereas the social media post that does incite violence, for example, I've seen a post saying, turn Gaza into a parking lot. That's insightful hate speech and insightful violence harming another population that should fall under hate speech and come with repercussions. I would also say that there needs to be a channel where students can feel comfortable uh, reporting violent speech that's uh, targeted towards them and makes one feel uncomfortable. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Ezra, what, what are your thoughts, um, either um, as, you know, response to some of what Hannah said, but then also the president of the Urbana-Champaign campus is is here. Uh, what are your expectations? Uh, what types of deliver deliverables, you know, would you pose to the president? Yeah. So thinking back to my freshman convocation and I remember sitting there in this state firm arena and uh, he was giving speech to everybody. And one of the things he said, I remember sticking out to me, even at the time, was you're going to come across people here who have different views than yourself, mm -hmm. but it's a place where we can have these conversations and these dialogues, but that's not what's happening right now. Right? So I think if the... I think the chancellor, the president, there is 
something they could do. I think they could find a way to ensure that the university is a place where we can have that dialogue rather than than people shouting you down. I think that's something that could further are you I think that's something that could further betterment the university. Right. If you right, I think it was I think I read an article over the weekend. And I think it said, right, if you're hanging around people who only have the same views as you while you're in college, that's the waste of the experience. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. I think that that is a very good, uh, a very good point. Um, I, I know, you know, Hannah, you are in the process of starting um, an SJP uh, chapter. And, you know, you mentioned that there is a Muslim student organization. Um, Ezra, what what do the student um, um, organizations look like at UIUC? Um, I know, so Hannah is sort of, you know, starting almost from scratch, you know, in, in a sense, in getting something established, but your experience might be a little bit different. Are there uh, established organizations on campus? Yeah, so, so like, Jewish organizations or like you could clarify for either side um are there organizations student organizations that maybe you you utilize or you're a member of but then also knowing that from Hannah's experience or perspective there aren't as many on her campus do you yeah. feel that it's balanced at at uh, your school that you know if Hannah was a student at the University of Illinois would she have a community um, to tap yeah, into. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, so I can say from my end, like, yeah, there's there are Jewish student groups, Jewish communities on the campus that I can, that I find I can be a part of, like a group that I can feel I belong to. It's hard for me to say what there is, what kind of Muslim student associations there are or Palestinian communities. From what I've seen, from being an outsider, from what I've seen, I would think those communities do exist. Mm -hmm. But I mean, okay. it's just, I can't speak to it because I'm not a part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the last thing that um, that I'll, I'll mention, there was, um, you know, and then we can, you know, maybe uh, set aside some time for Q&A. Uh, I want to make sure that those who are joining us have an opportunity for clarifying clarif clarifying questions or if they have questions that they'd like to uh, ask of you guys that they do. Um, but there was an article that was shared um, with us. Um, it was uh, a recent New York Times article and it was titled uh, College is All About Curiosity, um, you know, and, and it talks about, you know, um, and that requires free speech. Um, if you both, you know, in a, you know, two minute nutshell could share what you got from that article, um, you know, with those who are joining us and you don't have to give too much of a backstory, but a little bit, just share what, you know, that article encompassed and what you took from it. Hannah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's um, great. Well, what I took away from the article was essentially how um, how you need to be able to kind of coincide with those around you, um, and how, uh, free speech is one of those things where, uh, I don't know, it's hard to say necessarily, um, I haven't thought about that question too much. Okay, yeah, that's fine, that's fair something like free speech it's one of you know it's it's a topic that is ever changing you know um and oftentimes you don't know how you're going to react to whether it's a written piece whether it's something that someone um is saying or has said until you are in that moment you know and you are faced with that um um you know as read the uh, article um, you know, if, if you took, you know, something, you know, from that article in terms about, in, in terms of, you know, colleges about curiosity and, and free speech, um, could you share with us, you know, what you gathered from it? Or if you, you know, had to write your own New York Times article around <laughs> this topic, 
you know, what what would you include that perhaps, you know, that article didn't include or mention? Yeah, it was a hefty article. Definitely had to like sit back and just like process everything I've read. I feel like I've had to do that a lot these days. But generally, I think the university should be allowing as much speech as possible without regulating it. But, but when it, but, but the university can also help promote the civil discourse for unoffensive content on social media. So like I was saying before about ensuring students, students know the rights in the student code, which could help students express their opinions without creating a hostile environment, right? Because last thing, last thing we want is a threat to student safety because that's something that should definitely, if that were to happen as a result, that should be addressed promptly. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. So um, we have a few questions in the chat and and I know that other people are, are typing questions in. And so um, what I'd like to do um, over the next few moments, Ezra and Hannah, um, read some of these questions and, you know, whomever, you know, would like to respond, either one of you or the both of you, please feel free to do so. Um, so this one question uh, that came in, how do you both perceive available support from your university since October uh, based on your religion, ethnicity, both publicly and privately? Um, and so, you know, we talked about the clubs and organizations, but let's specifically think post-October, um, have there been people, services available to you? Um, well, on my campus, as I've said earlier, um, Palestinian students and Arab students in general, there is not an active source of help from faculty or student organizations, which is why I'm taking it amongst myself with some students to create a Students Justice for Palestine chapter in PACE. Uh, be, so students like myself who have felt that they don't have a community or anybody to go to faculty or student-wise have a place of support, um, whether they're Palestinian, Arab, or not. It's more so about having a community of support rather than um, just staying within the same group of your race or your ethnicity. Um, because I've noticed that, um, as I've said earlier, the Hillel chapter at Pace um, and the Student Supporting Israel Club are very active um, and in some ways intimidating um, for Palestinian students and for um, other Arab students. So um, with that intimidation being a factor, a lot of students are afraid to go out of their way to start these organizations, which is why I want to take the first step so there can be a balance of students feeling support in their community. Okay, very, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ezra, there's a question that came in um, to you and um, the question was, how do you perceive hate speech, i.e., um, do you feel uncomfortable about Gaza being a parking lot that uh, there was a, a comment made? Um, do you consider that hateful or hate speech? Um, if you recall that earlier in the, the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So the question specifically about that. Yeah, that is that, yeah. Do you consider that, that uh, statement hateful? Um, I don't know if that's something <laughs> that I need to think about, but, um, okay. <laughs> just in, um, I don't know if it's, um, uh, yeah, I, I feel that, I feel that it's hateful because I feel like, I don't know, you know, maybe it's hard to come back to me because I'm just like, yeah. it's still going through, it's still yeah, going through. Absolutely. Yes, the impromptuness of, of Q&A, keeping you guys on your toes. Um, I will mention that, um, you know, the, the comments in the chat, uh, 
you know, in addition to the questions, from what I can see, everyone is, you know, just very grateful to the both of you all that you have, you know, the courage and, you know, the insight to, you know, have this discussion, but also that you both are rallying for, you know, change, you know, as it relates to you and your campus and, and of course, your student experiences. Um, we have a couple comments that, you know, make mention of social media sites and, you know, some of them claiming to have a right to make the decision for themselves in terms of, you know, what's misinformation, um, you know, and, and what's not. Um, and I think that, you know, most of us, we, we are aware of um, sort of the ongoing debate that's taking place um, in DC around TikTok and freedom of speech, social media, you know, so there, there are a lot of uh, opinions, you know, around uh, that as well. Um, and let's see if, make sure I get all of the questions. Um, most are really, you know, a lot of comments, you know, people are really, you know, just very proud of, of the both of you all. Some suggestions here uh, based on some of the comments that you all have, have shared, which, you know, we've mentioned. Um, but, you know, while people sort of put in, you know, last minute questions, um, Ezra and, you know, Hannah, any last minute you know, comments that you all would like to share or, you know, if there's something that, you know, we didn't cover, or we didn't dive into, you know, what, what would you like to share with folks before we, um, you know, officially sort of, you know, conclude things? Um, well, I would like to share, um, cause I feel like there's a confusion of, um, kind of, hate speech and labeling when it comes to certain phrases surrounding the Israel and Palestine conflict. Um, and I would just like to discuss some of the phrases um, and how I feel they should be perceived. Um, for one, uh, a controversial statement that has come up is from the river to the sea. And I think this has been a misunderstood phrase because it is not an insightful saying of violence. This is about liberation of Palestinians and we need to stop using the threat of hypothetical violence to justify actual violence. Because as I stated earlier, I have lost uh, 30 family members in Gaza and they are victims of actual violence. Um, another phrase I would like to mention is um, uh, peace in the Middle East. Uh, this phrase is honestly offensive to me because when people have said it to me, they're always saying it in a joking manner about the circumstances of the conflict. And it is not used with uh, sincerity, which I feel is a shame, because as I've said before, this is a cause where I have lost family members and where I've seen um, family members I've never seen get emotional, get emotional. Um, and while everybody was having uh, Thanksgiving, celebrating at the dinner table, all of that, um, my family was sitting in silence due to a tragic death we have heard about. So when people say we just want peace in the Middle East, I find that to be an offensive phase, phrase. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And again, it goes to um, educating, you know, and thank you for using your voice to, you know, to inform people and to share these phrases, you know, that's, it's hateful. It's negative. You appreciate that. Um, Ezra, if you could, you know, um, you know, two minutes sort of, you know, just touch on anything that we didn't mention or anything that you want to say and I have an and in here. Um, there was a question, uh, a separate question that came in uh, to you. And I want to make sure that we you're able to touch on that question and we're able to sort of, you know, get your final uh, thoughts here. But the question to you, Ezra, is a university is a space to have open and safe dialogue. So how would a university creating a standard of what can be said based on what they believe is wrong and correct? So, which includes their own implicit bias. Is that okay? And we probably don't have two minutes. That's that's a, a pretty meaty question there. Um, so maybe what I want to do is you answer that as you see fit, including your sort of, you know, final thoughts. And if you care to elaborate on that further, then we can, you know, um, 
uh, you know, just make sure that, you know, you're able to answer that question so that uh, ad attendee can receive a response. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely a more than two minute answer, but <laughs> I'll, I'll give a, I'll give a maybe under 30 second answer. Um, I would say, look, there's, I'd say there are biases and there's also fact. So I think the, yeah, people can share their biases, but there has to be there has to be that environment where fact is also stated, so people can, so people like outsiders can see why this person might have that bias and right where it's coming from and a better perspective of the situation on the ground. And okay, some other comments just want to touch on. You know, I was thinking about the question I was asked earlier about turning Gaza into a parking lot. So something, which I think, you know, what if the, what this situation was the other way? Like the way, when I hear people chanting, when I hear people chanting from the river to the sea, I see that as, as a call for, as a call for the Jews to leave the land of Israel to be eradicated. And, right, so, so I kind of see those two as, I see them similar, right? You're, it would be leveling, like leveling Gaza or expelling the Jews from the land of Israel. So I'd say, I would say it does constitute a hate speech. Thank you for, for sharing that. And um, as we conclude our, our last five minutes here, um, there was a question that came in uh, to me and I'll be super quick here. Um, so the question was just, how did I, you know, connect with Ezra and and uh, Hannah? And um, at the start, we had mentioned that um, my company, Pira Technologies, we're a software company, and we um, we have software, um, and we basically collect data from alternative and unmoderated social media sites. I'm not gonna go through the list of those, but we collect from roughly 40 different sites and platforms, boards, and uh, through our technology, uh, which is an in-house built AI model, um, we're able to categorize posts and comments, uh, media, photographs, what have you, as violent and negative, hateful, or uh, offensive. And we also see a lot of misinformation. And um, our team recently, well, a few months now, it's a few months old now, we recently put together a, a piece, a case study that specifically talks about the rise of violence and threats on college campuses as it relates to the Israel um, and uh, Gaza conflict and everything that's it's going on in the Middle East. Um, but also, you know, just misinformation campaigns as a whole and how they threaten um, businesses and brands and reputations. And so we have a team of folks scattered around the world who um, work to make sure that academia, the legal space, uh, the commercial sector, government, law enforcement has tools available to track and monitor the upticks of uh, threats and violence and misinformation. And so um, that's how I came to be and to work with uh, Natanya and Kelly as um, today's moderator for this ev uh, today's event. Um, and again, it, it is all of our, our hope at PIRA, but you know, those of us who are participating on today's panel that, um, we do see a decrease in terms of the threats and the violence and the hateful rhetoric that is taking place on, on many college campuses. Uh, however, we do want to be cognizant and respectful of others' right to their opinions, uh, their speech, and most importantly, their experiences. And so with that, I just want to personally say thank you to everyone for um, allowing me, you know, to be a part of today's panel and work with two amazing 
young people who, as we can see from today, they are doing great things and will continue to do great things. And so I wish the both of you guys, you know, well, much success. And again, thank you all for allowing me to sit in today. Thank you, LJ. And thank you to Ezra and Hannah for having the courage to speak and to have a dialogue, even if it reflects different uh, opinions and experience, but also there's a lot of similarity and that's what we want to try to bring together. This is the idea of, as lawyers, we talk about the law with a big L and there are things happening, but as it filters down to the actual lived experience of a new generation, we want to be cognizant and more aware of what you're going through. So I want to thank you so much. And we hope that this is the beginning of um, a discussion. And Kelly and I came to this program thinking this would be maybe an ongoing forum where we can bring in other students and other experts in the fields to discuss this as we go forward, because this will be a continual, continuing challenge for the new generation and for us as lawyers. And as new generations become lawyers and, and, as new, and then they, they become leaders, that they can actually communicate with each other. So we thank everybody and our participants for joining today. We thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day.